We would like to welcome everyone to another edition of the speaker series in the Bingham Gallery. We invite you to return a week from now in which we will be meeting at the same time, same place to hear from another uh, group of lecturers. Next week, we will have the opportunity to hear from two co-speakers, Janet Colvin, Associate Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, along with Brian Waite, Department Chair, Secondary Education, who will be talking about voices of refugees and immigrants. Today, we have the honor to hear from Alan Perry, and his lecture is entitled, The Day Gravity and Curvature Met. Since ancient times, mathematicians have worked to not only understand the natural world, but also to discover the beauty and harmony inherent in mathematical systems. Studying mathematics without an immediate real life application, however, can sometimes feel like an obscure endeavor to many people. Every once in a while, however, a primarily mathematical adventure holds the key to a major discovery about nature. Such was the case in the early 20th century when the worlds of abstract geometry and gravitational physics collided to unlock the secrets of the structure of the universe. In this talk, we will discuss the mathematical ideas from Euclid to Riemann and the advances in physics from Newton to Maxwell that led Albert Einstein to make a connection between physics and mathematics that changed the way we view the cosmos forever. Alan Perry is an assistant professor of mathematics and associate chair of the Department of Mathematics at Utah Valley University. Dr. Perry earned a BS in mathematics from Utah State University and a PhD in mathematics from Duke University. His research specializes in differential geometry, mathematical physics, general relativity, and mathematics education. Please welcome Dr. Perry. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so <coughs> today, I kind of want to take you a, a little bit on a journey through uh, some, a pretty amazing story uh, in time. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about just the roots of knowledge in general. The, the roots of knowledge really is about stories. It's about the story of mankind and how we've come to know what we know. Uh, you can see through the entire uh, <coughs> gallery uh, different ways that we've learned and gained knowledge. The story that I want to tell you today is actually a bit of a love story. It's the <coughs> story between the courtship of gravitational physics and geometry. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're, I'm going to take you through a little journey that shows how classical geometry led to some really amazing modern geometry. And we'll learn about mathematicians such as Euclid and Gauss and Riemann. And along the way, we'll also learn about some physicists who had similar effects on the side of physics uh, with uh, people like Kepler and Newton and eventually Albert Einstein. <coughs> we'll also uh, learn how Albert Einstein used these ideas from geometry and the foundations in physics that he had uh, in order to unlock the secrets to how the universe kind of behaves. Uh, and so we'll start, uh, without any further ado, with our love story of the day gravity and curvature met. Uh, chapter one of this fun affair is to talk a little bit about abstract geometry, right? And I know everybody in here loves math, and so that's where we're going to start, right? Uh, anyway, uh, we do want to start with uh, <coughs> some ancient geometry. Sorry, I need to... Left one thing out of my bag. <coughs> we want to start with some ancient geometry. This, this is actually a slide from the Roots of Knowledge. This is a mathematician from ancient Greece named Pythagoras. However, uh, the <coughs> things we know about geometry didn't actually start in Greece, although sometimes we kind of popularize that it was. But uh, many cultures, including the Babylonians, the Indians, and the Chinese, all actually had the Pythagorean theorem, which is what Pythagoras is famous for, long before he was actually born. Uh, the P Pythagorean theorem is a fun theorem. It's going to play a big role in today's talk, uh, but it's also one of the probably the most, one of the more famous theorems in mathematics. Many people uh, uh, will know it and or try to quote it, quote it, although hopefully they do it better than the Scarecrow did in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, <laughs> If you've ever seen The Wizard of Oz and know anything about what the Pythagorean Theorem actually says, practically everything that the Scarecrow says after he gets his Doctor of Thinkology is absolutely and terribly false. But uh, it's really fun if you get a chance, you ought to take a look at it on YouTube. Uh, it's a really uh, shocking uh, <laughs> understanding of what the Pythagorean Theorem actually said. Uh, <coughs> the Greeks, what they're famous for is, is not so much the invention of some of these geometric ideas, but what they're famous for is really introducing the idea of logic and reason into the process. And we're going to talk a little bit about this guy named Euclid. And what, <coughs> in particular, what he did is he was one of the first mathematicians to try to put, uh, in, in particular, geometric ideas onto a logical foundation uh, so that they could use reasoning and logic in order to try to, to prove the things that had been known about geometry for many years. 
And he collected a lot of these different geometric facts into a book called Euclid's Elements uh, that basically placed uh, all of geometry onto what we'll call an axiomatic system, which I'll describe in just a second, uh, and then proved the geometric facts from there. Uh, so the axiomatic systems is actually an integral part of mathematics, and I think the best way to try to describe an axiomatic system to you is to talk about the game Uno, because I imagine everybody in here, or hopefully mostly everybody, has played the game Uno at some point. And there are, these days, dozens of variations of the game Uno. But if you look at all the different variations of the game, there are certain uh, aspects about a game of Uno that are always the same. For example, you know it's a game of Uno if it's going to use cards that have colors and numbers, and the general mechanic is that you play a card of either the same number or same color on another card that's on the table. And basically, any game that has that mechanic to it is essentially an Uno game. And so you can look, even if they change other things about it, they add a little bit of structure, or maybe add this weird typo thingy here, uh, you can still tell it's an Uno game because it still has that basic idea. Although sometimes, uh, even if they try to call it an Uno game, it might not actually fit in with this. This Uno Dominoes is kind of a black sheep here. It doesn't really fit in because it doesn't use those cards. So you could ask, is that really an Uno game, right? So what, what this turns out to mean, and what it, what it has to do with axiomatic systems, is the rules of Uno are what define what an Uno game is. And so if you want to play an Uno game, what you're really saying is, I want to play a game that follows these certain rules. An axiomatic system is exactly the same idea. What mathematicians often do is we try to create a world that has certain rules in it and then describe what follows from those rules. Kind of like thinking about the strategies that would come out of using the rules in Uno against your opponents. How, how can you play the game in different ways? <coughs> and the reason why we do this is because it turns out that certain types of axiomatic systems occur in lots of places. And so if we can break down that phenomenon into sort of its simplest pieces, then we can understand how it works for a broad number of different situations. That's the general idea. So really, when we do these axiomatic systems, we're trying to create little games that then tell us a little bit about how the world works. The, you can almost argue that the overall goal of science, in general, is to try to understand what the axioms of the universe is. What makes the universe work? Why do we, how, how do we know it behaves the way it does? What are the underlying rules that make the universe function? The problem is we don't know what those rules are. So all we have to do in science is to look at observation and try to glean deductively what those rules might be. Does that make sense? Uh, and so that's the basic idea here. And in fact, the axiomatic system that Euclid used to build up geometry is actually based on some pretty simple axioms. Uh, so we'll start with those. <coughs> he called them postulates, not axioms, but they mean the same thing. Uh, this is Euclid's first postulate. He basically said, so what he was trying to do is describe the geometry of a flat piece of paper. What kinds of things can you do on a flat piece of paper? The first thing that he suggested that should be an axiom or a rule of that space is that a straight line segment can always be drawn between any two points. You can do this with a ruler and a pencil. It's pretty simple. <coughs> the next is that if you start with a straight line segment, you can make it longer. Again, hopefully pretty simple. Uh, they're all pretty simple, I think. Uh, this one here, if you start with a line segment, you can use one of them as the center. It's like this one here is the center the other one as the edge, and use it sort of like a compass to draw a circle. Okay? Pretty straightforward. This next one's my favorite. Uh, it says that all right angles are the same measure, that they have the same measure. They're all the, the same size. This seems pretty simple, right? Uh, and then there's this one. If two lines are drawn, which intersect a third in such a way that some of the inner angles on one side is less than two right angles, then the two lines inevitably must intersect each other on that side if extended far enough. Simple, right? If you think that one is different than the other ones, you're not alone. <laughs> it certainly feels a little bit different. It's far more complicated. And one of the things about axioms is that we typically want them to be as simple of a rule as possible. Uh, but this was a little challenging because Euclid couldn't figure out how to get the geometry of a flat piece of paper without assuming this as a rule. Uh, and, but the big question that left is the fact that this is more complicated left many mathematicians to think that maybe you could do it without it. Before we go too further, just to try to demystify this a little bit, what this essentially says is if these two angles add up less than, to less than 180 degrees, these two lines, if you take them long enough, will hit each other. That's the basic idea of what the axiom is trying to say. So overall, it isn't that complicated. It's just a little weird to try to say. <coughs> 
Uh, but nonetheless, <coughs> the idea was this seems more complicated than the other axioms. So mathematicians for a long time at the beginning of this wanted to actually see if they could prove this from the other four axioms to see if all you had to do was actually assume those rules and you would get this rule for free. Uh, to investigate that claim a little bit, I want to try to maybe rephrase this because this actually has to do with what we call parallel lines. Uh, and for our discussion here, parallel lines are lines that don't touch each other, don't intersect. Uh, <coughs> and there are actually sort of three possibilities for the way uh, parallel lines could behave. Uh, and they all start with the same uh, sort of starting point, which is right here. You start with a straight line and a point off the line. And then you could ask the question, how many lines through that point can you draw that are going to be parallel to the original line? <coughs> you could maybe have what the elliptic parallel postulate says, which is that there aren't any. No matter what line you draw through that point, it'll eventually intersect. The Euclidean parallel postulate, which actually turns out to be equivalent to Euclid's postulate 5, is that there's exactly one. And this is probably the one that you're a bit more familiar with if you've done any amount of mathematics, because this is what happens on a piece of paper. On a flat piece of paper, if you draw a line and a point off that line, there's exactly one line through that point that will never intersect the original line. Okay. But the other possibility could be, well, what if there's more than one line that goes through there that doesn't ever intersect the original line? This is what's called the hyperbolic parallel postulate. And I actually want to talk a little bit about a couple of spaces that behave these ways. Uh, the first is, of course, Euclidean geometry, which is what everybody's familiar with. It is what Euclid was trying to describe, which is the geometry of a flat piece of paper. Uh, it satisfies the Euclidean parallel postulate. Uh, triangles add up to, this is the, another fact a lot of people usually remember, you add up all the angles in a triangle, you get exactly 180 degrees, or pi, not tau. Right, Bob? Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> triangles add to exactly 180 degrees, uh, and the Pythagorean theorem is true, which just to, for the record to state correctly is if you have a right triangle, then the sum of the squares of the two legs is the equal to the square of the hypotenuse. Okay, so that's the Pythagorean theorem that everybody knows and loves. They usually state it as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, uh, but what happens if you go to a sphere? On the surface of a sphere, and I have a little handout here, on the surface of a sphere like this, the lines, the things that behave like lines are things called great circles. A great circle is a circle drawn on the surface of the sphere that has the same diameter as the sphere itself. So you can imagine uh, the longitude lines on the Earth are all great circles. So is the equator. But no other latitude line is a great circle besides the equator because they don't have the same diameter as the sphere. Does that make sense? They kind of raise uh, parallel up. <coughs> Whereas the longitude lines all intersect at the North and South Pole, and they all have the same diameter. <coughs> Those lines actually behave very interestingly. This actually satisfies the elliptic parallel postulate. Every single great circle intersects every other great circle. So there are no parallel lines on the surface of a sphere. As a result, what happens on this game, because this is a different than an UNO game now, right? It's a different world. What happens on this world is different than what happens on a flat piece of paper. For example, the sum of the angles of a triangle actually has more than 180 degrees. And I'm going to hand this around so you guys can see a little bit closer. But on the surface here, I have drawn a well, it's 3D printed, we've drawn a, an equiangular right triangle. So this is a triangle that has three right angles in it. So that adds up to 270 degrees. But it's a triangle, which is kind of bizarre. So I'll <coughs> hand that off. You guys can take a look at that. Uh, as you might expect, it turns out the Pythagorean theorem does not hold on the surface of a sphere either. Although we'll learn a little bit later there's a way to sort of modify it so that it would. Okay. <coughs> Hyperbolic geometry is also pretty interesting. <coughs> In this space, the hyperbolic parallel postulate is true, which means that every line you draw and every point off that line, you can find more than one line through that point that's parallel, that never intersects the original line. Triangles, as you might expect, since it's also not an UNO game, behave differently, but it turns out that a hyperbolic geometry is a different UNO game, a different game entirely than the spherical geometry one. And in that case, the triangles actually have less than 180 degrees. So I have here another 3D printed object of a hyperboloid, which satisfies hyperbolic geometry. And if you can look at it when I pass it around, you'll notice that this angle here is a right angle. The other two angles are actually congruent, and if you look at them, you can, almost, you can eyeball that each of them are each less than 45 degrees, which means that the sum of the angles of this triangle is less than 180. <coughs> 
but it's still a triangle. So I'll pass that around too. <coughs> so we've got these kind of different worlds, but what was curious about this hyperbolic geometry one that's different than the Euclidean, th than different than the spherical one, is the spherical one actually didn't satisfy Euclid's first four rules either. As we, you know, it turns out that if you have two antipodal points, like say the North or South Pole, you can actually find a lot of lines through those two points that connect them instead of just one, like Euclid's first postulate said there should be. So that one was totally out from Euclid's point of view already because it didn't satisfy the first four rules. However, hyperbolic geometry actually does satisfy the first four rules of Euclid, which means that in order to get the geometry of a piece of paper, because a hyperboloid is also possible, you have to assume that fifth postulate in order to be in the right game. Does that make sense? If you don't assume it, you're in a different game. <coughs> and so that's kind of the, the challenge. It was a big surprise. And, you know, it's actually really interesting because Euclid was around in like 500 BC, three, three, three to 500 BC, I can't remember the exact date, but it took until the mid-1900s for us to actually prove that there were other geometries besides that flat uh, piece of paper geometry that satisfied the first four postulates of Euclid. And these are some mathematicians that, that contributed to that. Uh, Gauss and Schweikart, Bollier, Lobachevsky, Beltrami, Klein, and Killing, and eventually Riemann, all contributed to our understanding of what we now know as hyperbolic geometry. They basically ran with the idea that now we can find a model like that hyperboloid of hyperbolic geometry, and then what kinds of things are true there? There's a whole new world of geometry that was opened up in the mid-19th century, uh, uh, mid uh, yeah, 19th century. I said 1900s. It was the mid-1800s. It's the 19th century. Uh, Riemann, however, he was a student, this, this guy over here, Riemann at the end, was a student of Gauss's, and <coughs> he kind of went with it a bit, a bit further. He noticed that one thing that's true about the hyperboloid and the sphere is that the smaller you go, the closer to, you, to, the closer to flat Euclidean space you'd find, that you'd be. So here you can see a very large triangle, <coughs> I keep forgetting I've got to go to this one, <laughs> a very large triangle on the surface of a sphere doesn't behave like a Euclidean triangle at all. But if I zoom in really, really close to a tiny peninsula in Japan, in that tiny little city there, it turns out that in fact it does behave like Euclidean geometry. This is why you can make an atlas. C cities, uh, city maps can be drawn with very faithful representations of the lengths of roads and things like that. But you can never draw a single map of the entire globe that on a flat piece of paper that either doesn't get cut or doesn't distort the image. You can't do it. Okay? But you can do it in the small, and that's a very fascinating idea. In fact, I, uh, when I first arrived at UVU, I was very ambitious, and I had this great idea that we could detect the curvature of the Earth by drawing a big enough triangle and measuring the angles of that triangle to show that it was greater than 180 degrees. I was going to get a whole contingent of students to come with me to the Bonneville Salt Flats, and we were going to draw big triangles, we were going to use laser pointers or whatever to measure the angles. I was really, really excited about it, and I did a, a pencil and paper computation to figure out just how large of a triangle I'd have to make to get a one degree difference in its angle sum. So to find a triangle that had 100 181 degrees in it, and I found out that one of the sides of the triangle would have to be about 740 miles long, and I realized that this was maybe a little too ambitious. <laughs> <coughs> so it does turn out that when you're small, like on the order of a city, there's almost no difference between the geometry you see in that city and the geometry of a flat piece of paper. It's very easy to see why many people thought the earth was flat originally, because it looks very flat nearby. You have to look at larger scale kinds of things in order to detect the the fact that the Earth is curved. <coughs> well, this idea of the fact that the geometry in the small on a space is a lot like flat Euclidean space uh, led to the notion of what we call in mathematics a manifold. A manifold is a space that, while it may not look like a flat piece of paper everywhere, it looks like a flat piece of paper in really small circles around points, okay, really small areas. We sometimes call them neighborhoods. And so that's what this picture over here is depicting is even though the surface itself doesn't look flat, the tiny little pieces here do look flat. And you can kind of make an atlas out of it. In fact, we call the collection of those maps an atlas on the manifold because it's exactly what you think of as, an, as a road atlas. Okay? It's a collection of maps that, can, that string together. <coughs> and this brings up the idea of if you, even though you have a manifold that looks locally flat, you can still detect notions of what we call curvature. Curvature is just a weird math term for anything that's not flat. Uh, some measure of, of a surface's deviation from the flat case is what we call curvature. 
And the simplest way to think about it is to look at actually a curve here and talk about how bendy that curve is at every single point. Uh, now, I imagine not everybody in here is taking calculus, but the study of calculus is actually about talking about the direction that curves uh, move in or the rate of change of different quantities. If you draw a quantity as a graph, its rate of change turns out to be its slope, okay, how much its, its y value increases for how much you go forward in the x value. And so we try to detect the direction that a curve moves by using a tangent object, which is an object that kind of looks real close to it when you're nearby, and maybe hits it at, that, at one point of tangency, that has constant direction. That's what, we're gonna, that's what we use to define the direction. We call this a tangent line. That tells you the direction of a curve, okay? Its slope is what we define as the slope of the curve there. Well, if you want to talk about the bendiness of a curve, you would want to do something similar. You'd look for a tangent object that has constant bendiness. Well, what do you think has constant bendiness? A circle has constant bendiness. So we look for tangent circles. Now, how curvy a circle is depends on its radius. If its radius is really large, it's not very bendy. If its radius is really tiny, it is very bendy. Uh, that's kind of an inverse relationship to what we want, right? We want something big to mean big and bendy and something small to mean not very bendy. So instead, we use one over the radius as the measure of curvature here. So that the larger the radius is, one over r, one over the radius gets small. So you have smaller curvature for larger radii and higher curvature for smaller radii. And that's essentially what we have here in this picture. So how do you extend this to a surface? Okay. <coughs> well, on a surface, what you do is you take a, you know, <coughs> maybe this is a morbid example, but you guys have all seen the, uh, the, the magic trick where they saw an assistant in half, right? And they use those cool, like, uh, 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 plain saws, right? It's just a, like a flat sheet metal, and they slide it into the box. Well, if you can imagine what the cross-section would be of the cut-in-half lady at that point, that's what we're talking about doing to this surface. I told you it was a little morbid. Anyway, the <laughs> if you slice this surface... Uh, just right with one of those slices, you get a curve in that intersection of the slice. Since that's now a curve, you can use this notion to define how bendy that curve is. And then you can look at this in every possible direction. So slice it in every possible way as you rotate around and look at all the different curves. It turns out that you'll find a maximum curvature and a minimum curvature, as, as, as curvy it can be in any direction and as not curvy as it can be in any direction. These are called the principal curvatures. Their pro I know, it's getting weird. We've got a whole bunch of words here, right? But their product is an important number called the Gaussian curvature. If you take that product, it tells you something about the way the, curve, the, the surface looks. And so I'll give you an example. <coughs> I have three surfaces here, two of which I've been passing around. We have a sphere on the right and a hyperboloid on the left. And in the middle, we have a cylinder. It turns out that if you do that exercise where you slice through and go around every different possible direction and look at the maximum minimum curvature and take their products on the hyperboloid, they'll have different signs because you can see it curves sort of inwards here but then outwards this way. So they're pointing in different directions. So you get a negative product because they have different signs. Okay, so this is a negatively curved surface, kind of like a saddle. The surface of the sphere gives exactly the same curvature in every single point, and it's all positive, uh, all the same, all the same uh, direction. So its product is going to be positive, and you get positive curvature on this sphere, which kind of means it all bends in the same way. If you look at the cylinder, though, this is a really weird case, because here it does bend this way, but then when you get to this direction, there's no bendiness at all. So the maximum and minimum, one of them is going to be zero. So when you take the product, you get zero which means zero curvature, which should mean flat, right? But I don't know, that doesn't look exactly flat to me. Until you realize, how do you make a can? Well, what's one way you can make a can? If you take a sheet of paper, and you roll, which is totally flat, and you roll it up and glue the ends together, don't you get a cylinder? But you haven't stretched anything. You haven't changed the internal geometry of that piece of paper. An ant living on that surface could not tell the difference. So that surface actually is flat, even though from our perspective it doesn't look like that. This is the difference between what we call intrinsic geometry, which is the geometry the ant can tell, and extrinsic geometry, which is the geometry that an, a faraway observer could see. Okay? <coughs> the ant can't tell the difference between that cylinder and a flat piece of paper, so it satisfies Euclidean geometry, which is pretty neat. All right, we're going to transition now uh, to where do we get this geometry from? <coughs> 
And it turns out the Pythagorean theorem comes back in sort of a, with a vengeance. This is where, what Riemann contributed. He took these manifolds and showed that you, can de- that you can determine the geometry of the space by looking at a Pythagorean theorem in the small. I'll call it an infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem. This is essentially what the Pythagorean theorem looks like in R3. You can see it, a squared plus b squared plus c squared equals d squared, right? It's the same idea, okay? Uh, but what happens is that you can actually modify that Pythagorean theorem and get something like this, where you have these coefficients that depend on where you are. And if you allow that Pythagorean theorem to change like that, you can describe all sorts of spaces. For example, the, the Pythagorean theorem, the infinitesimal small Pythagorean theorem on the sphere has a form like this, okay? that you can write out. So that's the idea, and it turns out that all the geometry comes from this. Now here's probably the most complicated image I have on all the slides, and I apologize for that, but it gets at an interesting idea. (coughs) What I want to describe here is how that infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem helps us understand a little bit about the geometry of that space. See, the, the problem is, is we can't talk about typical rates of change. See, in calculus, you talk about rates of change by looking at tangent objects, which I end up going straight lines. But the problem is that if you have a curved surface, you can't move in a straight line without leaving the surface. So you have to account for the fact that you want to stay on the surface when you move. So you adjust what your rate of change is in order to make sure that it stays on the surface. So if you look at this V here, it's an arrow, we call it a vector field because it produces a different arrow at every single point along this dotted line curve. And you can kind of see that at this point, it's sort of moving, the direction it's moving in is sort of trying to change this way. So the change in direction is like this. And that's what this guy here, this vector, is supposed to be showing. The problem is that doesn't lie on the surface of the, of the uh, it doesn't lie on the surface. It's not tangent to the surface. So what we'll do to correct this is we project it back into what we call the tangent plane in that surface, okay? Which forces that rate of change to stay on the surface. And that's the basic idea. So we modify our notion of rate of change to account for how the surface moves as well. That's the basic idea. You can ignore the image now. (laughs) But what this allows us to do is it allows us to talk about things like lines. So let me ask you, what is a line? I mean, I kind of have half the answer up there, right? A line uh, from math, when, when when you've probably attended math classes before, is a line that has the same slope everywhere. We kind of already mentioned that. It has constant slope, right? Okay, (coughs) well... The slope is the rate of change of its position. So the slope also represents what you might call the velocity or how fast it's changing, right? Well, how fast the velocity changes, what do you think you call that? What's the rate of change of velocity? It's acceleration. It's how fast you speed up the car, right? That's making your speed change, right? So the rate of change of the slope is what you'd call acceleration. If this has a constant slope, that means the slope doesn't change. So its rate of change would have to be zero. So you could define a line as a, as a curve whose acceleration is zero, or a non-accelerating curve. Okay? If we use this idea, we can then extend that to the idea of our curved rate of change that we had before. I keep using the word rate of change to try to not use scary math terms, but in math we call rate of change derivatives. So if I happen to slip up and use the word derivative, I meant rate of change. Okay. <laughs> All right, (coughs) what we do is we take that curved rate of change that we described on the previous slide, and we say that the straightest possible line you can make is a line whose curved acceleration is zero. Does that make sense? It's curved second derivative or curved second rate of change is zero. And this object is something we call a geodesic. And so you, or a geodesic, however you want to pronounce it. I mentioned before on the surface of a sphere that the great circles were the things that acted like lines. That's because the great circles are these geodesics. They have zero acceleration if you take into account the curve itself. Another way to think about this, and this is the takeaway from geometry I want you to grab, so if you understand nothing else about the first part of this talk, this is it. A geodesic describes motion under no other influence other than the surface. Okay? So if you're on the surface and you are trying to go in the straightest possible line you can, you still have to stay on the surface. So your motion will still change with the surface, but, under, but won't change in any other way. That's a geodesic. Okay? Now we can take a breath, because I'm mostly done with the math part for a bit. We're going to talk about gravitational physics now, which is totally less scary, right? Yeah. Well, gravitational physics <coughs> uh, has, 
similar, uh, actually in many ways, very similar beginnings. Uh, it, it did start a bit with Greece, but there were other mathematicians that also uh, were involved with this. Uh, this is an uh, Indian mathematician and physicist named Arya Bhatta, and what he believed about uh, gravity was that it had, he was one of the first ones to notice that things sort of uh, went towards the earth, and so he thought of the earth as being uh, sort of the, the, the <coughs> as the thing that sort of glued everything together, everything kind of fell to the earth, and so he presented a geocentric model of the universe, which was the earth is the middle of the universe, and everything falls towards it. Okay, which you can think of as, you know, as a first estimate, that's pretty good because everything you throw up does come back down to the earth. Okay. <coughs> now, of course, the <coughs> there are other mathematicians and physicists. Another Indian one uh, was a guy named Brahma Gupta, uh, and he uh, suggested that it was the nature of the earth uh, to attract things and that the earth was the only low object. And again, kind of emphasizing this geocentric model of the universe. Uh, on this next slide here, we have Aristotle, and this is another Roots of Knowledge slide. You guys can find Aristotle and Pythagoras and Euclid on the, uh, where is it over here? Uh, the School of Athens, I think it's right over there. There it is over, th over there. The School of Athens uh, is a painting by Raphael that's represented here on the Roots of Knowledge, and you can see a lot of these famous uh, Greek mathematicians and philosophers there. Aristotle was a great philosopher, but he also had a notion about gravity, and he thought that gravity had to do with the nature of the object that the earth and other heavy things had a tendency to go down, but things like fire and air or other light things had a tendency to go up. And so we're kind of getting to this kind of weird realm where uh, it has to do with, you know, what the thing is. But you can see kind of how initial observations might have led you to these conclusions. But that's what science does, is it constantly corrects itself as it gets more and more observations, which is a general theme on this physics side of the talk that you'll see. Uh, next, uh, uh, about a thousand years later, we come across Copernicus, and he was one of the first to say, wait a minute, I don't think the Earth is the center of the universe. It should actually be the sun, because the, the way all the planets move follow more the way that they should be follow, uh, uh, orbiting the sun, not us. <coughs> and so he presented a heliocentric model, which uh, Galileo Galilei uh, looked at, and also uh, he, he supported another idea, too, that's also really important. He has a famous experiment uh, Galileo does. I mean, obviously he supported Copernicus's heliocentric model too, but he had a uh, pretty neat experiment that refuted Aristotle's notion of gravity, and this is the Tower of Pisa experiment, where he dropped two, uh, where it's kind of apocryphal, nobody knows if he actually did this or if it was just a thought experiment, but the story goes that he took two balls of different sizes and dropped them off the Tower of Pisa and noticed that they fell at exactly the same rate and in this depiction hit somebody down at the bottom. I don't know if that really happened or not, but uh, nonetheless. This, this experiment, by the way, was famously recreated on one of the moon landings with a feather and a, uh, and a hammer. And the reason why they did it with a feather there is that on Earth, because of the air and the atmosphere, the feather gets some resistance and doesn't fall at the same rate because the resistance of the air pushes it back up. Uh, however, on the moon, there is no air, and so it could fall freely without any problem. And sure enough, the feather and the hammer fell at exactly the same rate and landed on the surface of the moon at precisely the same moment. Uh, again, uh, confirming the notion that gravity really had nothing to do with the nature of the object itself, but that everything fell at the same rate. <coughs> Pretty big idea. Using these ideas, uh, Kepler uh, started diagramming what the planets should do. And he came up with three laws of planetary motion which later influenced Isaac Newton, who is also on, on here. I kind of wish he had gotten a bit of a bigger picture on the roots of knowledge, but he's a tiny little guy right around this, this king's head over on the left. You can't even see him from here. This is a serious close-up. But this is Isaac Newton. Uh, <coughs> his apples are all over the place in that panel, though, so he's really famous for those. <laughs> That's really good. But, uh, uh, but Isaac Newton was a hero in both realms of the th stuff we're talking about today, in both physics and mathematics. Uh, not only did he discover a lot about gravity and, and stuff that I'll talk about in a minute, he also happens to be one of the fathers of calculus. He and, a, and another guy named Leibniz independently invented calculus at about the same period of time. And so all these rates of change and derivatives, it's his fault. Okay? <laughs> but, that's the, but that's what helped us understand a lot of this stuff. Uh, so you can see already that there's some interplay between the physics and the mathematics that's, that's going on and stuff we've already talked about. Uh, but what, what Newton's really famous for is this inverse square law where he showed that the force due to gravity between two masses, one of mass little m and one of mass bigger m, is proportional to the 
one over the square of the diff distance between them, okay? <clears throat> and so this meant that the further away you go from an object, the less pull it has on you. And using this, he was able to mathematically prove Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which was a huge success. Because Kepler had already made these observations and shown that the planets behaved this way, and Newton came up with a theory that implied it. You see what I meant about earlier about the idea that scientists are taking observations and they're trying to understand the rules of the space? This is an example of that. Kepler made some observations. Einstein discovered the rule that caused those observations. Okay, so he found maybe not quite an axiom, but maybe a predecessor theorem or pre you know, preceding uh, fact that led to it. Uh, it also shows, and in particular, Kepler's laws of planetary motion shows that orbits are ellipses. And so this is a picture of the solar system. I think it's actually pretty close to scale, which is why you can't see any of the inner orbits. Because we're so close to the sun, it's ridiculous. But these other planets are much further away. And it turns out that Newton's law of, of, of gravity actually says that all the planets interact, which has some interesting effects. In fact, one of the things that, uh, that <coughs> we noticed, uh, actually in the mid-1800s as well, had to do with the planet Uranus. <coughs> the planet Uranus, uh, there was an a astronomer <coughs> by the name of, see, uh, this is why I brought my paper with me, because I've got to remember all these names, Alexis Bovard, uh, who had done a huge job in trying to plot out the movements of all the planets in the solar system. And all of his models and tables were incredibly accurate, except for the model for Uranus. It wouldn't match up with his later observations. And so it got him thinking, what could cause this? And he actually hypothesized that there could be another planet that was yet to be discovered. Now, at this time, we only had discovered seven planets in the solar system. So he hypothesized that there might be an eighth planet whose tugs are causing Uranus's error in its orbit. He died not too long uh, after this, but shortly after his death, um, <coughs> some other astronomers, two, two astronomers actually independently, a guy named John C. Adams and Urbain Le Verrier, calculated the position of this hypothetical new planet. Le Verrier's calculation turned out to be a little bit more accurate because he gave his data to an astronomer named Gall, who pointed a telescope at where Le Verrier told him to and found Neptune. That's how we discovered Neptune. It is pretty awesome because this planet was predicted by a gravitational physics theory. And then we found it. That is nuts. Okay? But this is a huge success of Newtonian gravity. So at this point in time, everybody's like, wow, Newton rocks. This is amazing. Well, actually, I guess this, it's more gas, right? So Newton was full of gas? I don't know. No, that's probably not right. But New Newton was amazing because he was able to predict this. And then, interestingly enough, about 13 years later, that same astronomer, Le Verrier, started doing other calculations with other data that had been collected over the years and found out that Mercury's orbit was actually wrong, too. That what we predicted for Mercury's motion didn't work right. So this, this picture requires a little bit of explanation. See, Kepler described that the planetary motion around two, uh, if a body's orbiting another one, it would follow an ellipse. But what happens if you enter other bodies into the mix, into that solar system, that tug on it, it causes that ellipse to rotate a little bit. We call this processing. So the elliptical orbit of Mercury around the Sun actually rotates a little bit because of the tugs mainly of Venus and Earth. The other ones are too far away to make much of a difference. But you can predict how much this tug should occur because you know the masses of Venus and Earth. And so they did this computation, Le Verrier did. And then he looked at data that actually measured this precession over the last 200 years and found out that they were off by a statistically significant amount, that the observations didn't match the calculations. This calculation was later uh, done by another uh, physicist uh, named um, Simon Newcomb. Uh, who computed a little bit more accurately and found that the difference was about 43 arc seconds per century. I think that's the right units. Uh, <coughs> and what an arc second is, it's, it's 1 hundredth of a degree. Okay? So not very much movement, but enough that you can actually measure this. And they usually measure this during an eclipse, you can, or, or sorry, during a transits of Mercury around the Sun, which actually one just occurred on Monday or Tuesday of this week, and you could have watched it. So during those transits, they can actually measure where, these, where this uh, perihelion, that's this closest point to the sun that Mercury does. So that was a failure of the Newtonian physics, and it was only 13 years after another success. Well, there was another experiment that came about, and this is called the, uh, named after the two physicists who performed it, uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment. <coughs> and what they discovered, they were actually trying to detect uh, what was popularly thought of as 
the medium that light traveled through called the ether. They were trying to detect the flow of the ether, or the ether wind, they called it. And so they created an experiment that would look at the light rays in perpendicular directions, and then it would rotate on actually a bed of mercury. So, you know, mercury's causing all sorts of problems, but <laughs> it would rotate on a bed of mercury and, and float around, and they would measure the speed of light in basically every possible reference frame imaginable trying to find one that was making the light travel faster or slower to see if they could detect which way the ether wind was trying to push it. But they found something that I don't know if they expected or not, but they actually showed that the speed of light was the same in every single one of those reference frames. It did not change speed, no matter which way it was moving, and they should have detected something. Even if they didn't find the ether wind, they should have detected some difference in all those different reference frames. They never did. Other experiments, including ones by Fizeau about measuring the speed of light underwater, ver verified the same thing, that essentially the speed of light should be constant in every reference frame, every way you look. No matter how fast you're traveling, this, you measure the speed of light the same. So these were the big problems that were facing physics and, and, gravi and gravity at the period of time uh, that we enter this th chap the third chapter where gravity actually meets curvature. A few physicists started trying to tackle this problem, and around the same time, uh, James Maxwell uh, came up with a really beautiful theory that we still use today about electromagnetism. It basically showed that electricity, magnetism, and light were all basically the same thing and wrote down equations that described their behavior, called the Maxwell's equations. They transform in a very special way, uh, and his <coughs> people who later studied his stuff after him, including Lorentz, uh, showed that the way they transform is due to Lorentz transformations, which are a little bit different. Uh, what they are, what a Lorentz transformation is, is how do you change coordinates from one set of coordinates to the other? How does that change the equations? And it turns out it didn't behave the way regular Euclidean or flat space did. It was a little bit different. Uh, but nonetheless, it preserved what we were observing with electricity and magnetism. And this is where Albert Einstein enters the scene. He got his PhD around 1905, and in that year published six incredibly influential papers all at once. I will probably be lucky, lucky to publish maybe even one influential paper in my entire career, and he does six massive ones in his first year as a PhD. This guy was a genius. Uh, and what, but one of, the, one of the two that he presented was the, one of the six, actually two of the six, were on what's called the special theory of relativity, where he resolves one of, the mass, one of the big problems in physics at the time, which was the constancy of the speed of light in every reference frame. So he brings up special relativity, and the big ideas in special relativity were that space and time were not distinct quantities. They were not things that everybody would measure the same. He also showed that space-time coordinates have to transform with those Lorentz transformations that, that uh, Lorentz had used to apply to Maxwell's equations, which showed that this was actually a kind of a Maxwell theory as well. Uh, he showed that how we measure time and space depends upon our reference frame, including things like simultaneity, meaning that you and I don't necessarily agree on what events happen at the same time. That's really bizarre. Time is not absolute. Depending on how fast you're going, what events you, the order of events you think occur may not be the same as the order of events somebody else sees. It's really, really strange. <coughs> However, it does prove that it does show that the speed of light would be constant no matter what your coordinate frame would be, and it turns out the speed of light would be a maximum relative velocity as a result of all this. Well, Herman Minkowski was actually one of Einstein's uh, math professors when he was going to school, and he went to a talk uh, by Einstein, and I'm sure read a lot of his papers, and realized that the geometry that we talked about a while ago by Riemann had a way of describing exactly what Einstein was talking about, and that you could do it with an infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem. So he presented a talk about a year later that said this may be the standard Pythagorean theorem on a regular space-time, three spatial coordinates, one time coordinate, so this is four-dimensional Pythagorean theorem. You can see it's the same thing, a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared equals e squared, right? It's just a big Pythagorean theorem. And he said, Einstein, you can get everything that you just said should happen by doing that. And I'm not even kidding. So he puts in a little minus sign into that, into that infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem and shows that the geometry that results is exactly what Einstein was trying to describe. Einstein, of course, was very resistant to this idea at first. Not that it was necessarily wrong, but he didn't think it was necessary to think about it. In fact, he referred to it as superfluous learnedness. 
I think maybe he was a little offended at it, I don't know, but, <laughs> but he didn't really feel that it was uh, <laughs> really necessary to talk that way. But I do like this because this shows, again, a time where we have a bunch of observations, an amazing, beautiful theory that's created out of the mind of Einstein to describe it, and then a rule that generated exactly what Einstein said. And so it's again, again, back to that same idea of science trying to look for the rules that describe the phenomenon that you observe. Uh, well, <coughs> so time, time went by a bit, and one thing about the special relativity, special theory of relativity that Einstein had not resolved was how does it deal with gravity? And it turned out he couldn't make it work quite in the framework of special relativity. So we kind of had to start over. And there were a few other mathematicians and physicists that influenced him at this point, including one Ernst Mach, who is that Mach for like the speed of sound Mach. It's that Mach one. Uh, <coughs> he, uh, he had an interesting principle that Einstein actually dubbed Mach's principle, uh, which was, uh, can be phrased in a lot of different ways because Mach was never really precise about it. Uh, but one uh, a way that I think is pretty instructive is the idea that the global structure of the universe affects the local structure of the universe. Uh, so things at very far distances can affect what happens nearby you. It's kind of the basic idea. And this led Einstein to come up with uh, kind of three big ideas that maybe I think is usually organized into sort of two now. The first is that physics should be the same no matter what coordinate system you use. No matter what your point of view is, you should measure physics exactly the same. And in fact, physics should actually be completely determined by whatever the infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem is of the geometry that you're sitting in. Uh, so those are kind of the ideas. Those are sometimes referred to as general covariance. Uh, the third idea, which is more related to what he later called Mach's principle, is that the global matter distribution controls the infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem. So how the matter is distributed everywhere controls the way you measure uh, uh, things with an, a small Pythagorean theorem. <coughs> That's called Mach's principle. The third idea that led to the general theory of relativity is what Einstein referred to as his happiest thought which was the notion that if a person falls freely, he'll not feel his own weight. And he had a couple of great thought experiments, including one that if you jumped off of a house and then tried to release a ball at the same time, you wouldn't see the ball move in your reference frame because it'd be falling just as fast as you are. And so you wouldn't think that it's actually moving. So you couldn't tell that you were actually falling and from that perspective. Uh, another one that's, that we can do now better because we have, we have some really awesome scales. Because uh, we, you know, if you think about an elevator, we know we're going up the elevator because we know how it works. But if you were to put a scale on the floor of the elevator and step on it before the elevator moved, you would weigh what you normally weigh uh, on, on the surface of the earth. As soon as the elevator started going up, while the elevator is accelerating, your weight would actually increase on the scale. Because the scale can't tell the difference between gravity and acceleration. It can't. Okay, so your weight would go up until the, until the elevator gets to a constant speed, and then as it slowed down, your weight would actually go lower than what it would actually, now everybody's thinking, I've got to get a scale and try this. <laughs> okay, it would be cool. I, I, I want to see across campus, every time I get in an elevator, I want somebody in there standing on a scale. Okay, it'd be fantastic. But anyway, the idea is that you can't tell the difference between gravity and acceleration. This was huge, and this is the idea of what's called the equivalence principle that there's no difference between gravity and acceleration. Well, Einstein was trying to reconcile all these ideas, and he couldn't figure out how to do the mathematics. Well, around 1912, he took a position that had a uh, fantastic mathematician named Marcel Grossman, uh, who, while he wasn't at the time an expert in this Riemannian geometry we were talking about, um, Einstein asked him one day, basically, hey, I need to find uh, some generally covariant quantities that only depend on this infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem. Can you help me out? And so he took a day in the library and said, came back the next day and said, yeah, actually, Riemannian geometry does exactly that. And so here we come, to, come at it again, which is exactly, by the way, what, Schwar what uh, uh, Minkowski had used to talk about special relativity. And so between Grossman and Einstein, they worked together to apply Riemannian geometry to the theory of relativity to get a workable theory of gravitation. And uh, at this period of time, Einstein said something that I think en encapsulates uh, precisely the theme of this talk. By the way, this is another picture of Einstein that's just right over, uh, right over there in the Roots of Knowledge. You can see how we're kind of flowing along in the Roots of Knowledge. This quote by Einstein um, <coughs> during this period of time, I think, shows exactly what I mean about how mathematics and, and, and physics influenced each other. He said during this time when he worked with Grossman, he said, at present I occupy myself exclusively with the problem of gravitation and now believe that I shall master all difficulties with the help of a friendly mathematician here. But one thing is certain, in all my life, 
I have, not, I have labored not nearly as hard, and I have become imbued with great respect for mathematics, the subtler part of which I had in my simple-mindedness regarded as pure luxury until now. Compared with this problem, the original relativity is child's play, which I thought was great, because now he's seeing that you know, this Riemannian geometry was amazing, and he did actually later recognize uh, Minkowski's contribution to apply Riemannian geometry very early on in the process. Uh, and so in 1915 and 1916, uh, Einstein comes out with the general theory of relativity. And its big ideas can be summed up, I think, uh, real simply with the big idea from the geometry section we had. Remember, this is basically the same statement I told you to remember from geometry. That geodesics are motion under no influence other than the geometry of the space. Well, free fall, which is what happens when my dad over here used to be, uh, is in the audience today, he used to skydive. He always said that there was never a plane that was too good to jump out of or something like that, right? I, I probably got it wrong. But anyway, <coughs> he knows all about free fall, right? Because when you jump out of a plane, you're falling under no influence other than gravity, and that's exactly what free fall is. <coughs> so free fall is motion under no influence other than gravity. Well, look at these two statements. They're almost exactly the same. I just changed the nouns. So Einstein and Grossman realized, what if those are actually the same statement? <coughs> and so they come up with general relativity. I, Einstein made these connections more, uh, more than Grossman. Grossman helped him with the math mainly. But in general relativity in 1915, Einstein produces three big, uh, uh, so, some big ideas that revolutionized the way we thought about gravity. The first was that massive bodies warp space and time. They changed the shape of the space-time continuum. And that this warping can be described by an infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem of the type that Minkowski introduced, and that this quantity would be measured the same by everybody, but it's a space-time quantity. And that free fall is geodesic. So essentially what this says is that there is no force of gravity. It doesn't exist. Instead, massive bodies warp the fabric of space-time. They put dimples in it, like the sun will put a dimple in the fabric of space and time, and the Earth will be caught in the dimple, trying its best to follow a straight line, but because the space it lives in is curved, it follows a closed path. Just like the great circles on a sphere are a closed path, but it's the straightest possible line you can get. And this is probably the most impressive 3D printed model I have. Uh, which is that of a gravity well. I'll pass this around too so you guys can see that it creates a bend in the fabric of space-time, the sun does, and that the Earth, the little orb there, is caught in that, having to orbit the curvature of that. Uh, because of the curvature there, it orbits the surface, the, uh, orbits the, plant, the sun there. Anyway, so I'll pass that around so you guys can kind of see what, what we mean there. <coughs> uh, and so this is actually one of the most beautiful theorems, uh, 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 theories I've ever seen because they wrapped it up in a nice little package. Everything we just said can be described by this, what is this, uh, five-character equation, okay? This is the Einstein equation. Uh, the G on the left-hand side is called the Einstein curvature tensor. And it, what it does is it measures how bendy the surface is. On the right-hand side, you see this T. It's called the stress-energy tensor, and what it measures is the matter distribution in the universe. So this equation literally says the curvature of the space is equal to where the matter is. Does that make sense? Which is exactly what we said just a minute ago, that massive bodies will curve the fabric of space-time. And here it is in a beautiful little equation. Well, as a result of the Einstein equation, we get some huge successes, one of which came right out of the box. So we had already had this measurement of the precession of mercury. Now with general relativity and the power of that, he does the computation again, this time with the framework of general relativity. And guess what? General relativity actually shows that orbits should precess anyway, even if there aren't other planets. And, ex and the difference of how much that precession should be for mercury and the sun was almost exactly the 43 arc seconds that was missing from the computation before. Huge success right out of the gate. Another big one is <coughs> the Einstein's theory predicted that even though, even though Newton's theory said light should bend around massive bodies, Einstein's theory said the bending should actually be about twice as much as what Newton predicted, as what Newton's theory predicts. And so in 1919, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington uh, uh, led an expedition to actually measure how fast, how much the light bends around an eclipse. And you'll have to talk to some astronomers here about how exactly they do this measurement. But he showed that the observation actually matched Einstein's number, not Newton's number, which showed, again, Einstein, huge success for Einstein in 1919. 
The third thing that he predicted in his 1915 paper was what's called gravitational redshift. Now what this is actually an artifact of is that the gravitating body actually, because it warps space and time, causes objects closer to the surface to measure time differently than objects further away from it. So as a result, when photons travel from a light emanating surface, because it's the way it measures time changes, it will redshift, meaning its frequency gets lower as it moves away from the object. And you can measure this. Although they didn't have the tools at the time, Einstein met, published his paper to do so. In fact, this wasn't actually a, uh, correctly observed until 1954, but it was nonetheless observed, and this was something completely predicted by Einstein's theory, not something people thought would have occurred beforehand. Some other successes that came a little bit later, uh, this, this was uh, 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 predicted by <coughs> a model that was presented a few years after Einstein's main paper, but that the universe was actually expanding. Einstein's equation suggested the universe should expand. Edwin Hubble uh, observed this in 1929. Uh, <coughs> not long after the publication of General Relativity uh, was a paper published by Carl Schwarzschild, which, amongst other things, postulated the existence of, of black holes, which we have now since observed, and in fact, I think even got a picture of earlier this year. That's another thing that was predicted by Einstein's theory of gravity. But this next one, I think, is going to be everybody's favorite. Because how many of you use GPSs in your car to get different places? Okay. Every time you get in your car, believe it or not, you have to use general relativity because the satellite that's talking to your GPS system in your car is traveling a lot faster than you are in orbit. That extra speed causes it to measure time differently. It's also further away from the surface of the Earth than you are. That also causes it to measure its time differently. So in order to keep the time on the satellite synced with the time in your car so that you can get directions in real time, they have to artificially force the clock on the satellite to run slow so that it stays synced with your clock on the surface. If they did not do this, the GPS satellite would be obsolete in something like six hours. You couldn't use it after that. It'd be so far off. <coughs> so Every time you get in the car, next time you ask it to tell you to, the directions to get somewhere, you realize you have Einstein to thank for the possibility of having that kind of technology because it uses general relativity and you use it every single day. Uh, to close out, I want to actually quote uh, Galileo Galilei. This quote is actually on the roots of knowledge right above uh, Galileo here. I believe it's that quote next to the uh, Fibonacci um, uh, spiral there. <coughs> I've translated, of course, on, on the roots of knowledge, I believe it's in Italian, but I've translated it here, or rather looked up the translation, I can't speak Italian. But anyway, <laughs> he said that the universe cannot be understood without first learning to comprehend the language and know the characters as it is written. It is written in mathematical language and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is impossible to humanly understand a word. Without these, one is wandering in a dark labyrinth. And I think, hopefully, you can see how geometry has affected our, our understanding of the way the universe works today. And I hope you had a, a fun time learning about some of the things that Einstein produced, and that it really does show the interaction of different branches of science. It was a huge interdisciplinary endeavor to come up with general relativity. I really hope you guys enjoyed uh, listening to me today, and I appreciate you. They tell me I have until 2 o'clock, so I guess there's two minutes for questions if anybody had one. Yeah, Bob? When were gravitational waves predicted? That is a good question. I'm not certain when they were predicted, but we certainly have been trying to get good observations of them. Yes. <coughs> yeah, they were observed recently. That, that, that's true. But I think they were predicted a little bit later. But yeah, but I'm not exactly sure the time frame. Any other questions? Yes? Okay, mine's a very... There are, don't worry about that. Okay, you mentioned earlier that for two people, things, you know, they can see things very differently in order. Could you give an example of that? Yes, I can. There's actually a famous paradox that goes with this, and, and I wish if I had a whiteboard I could show you the picture of how this works. Uh, but what happens, uh, there, the paradox that Einstein used is sort of a thought experiment. Well, I don't know if Einstein used it, but it's the idea of what's called the, uh, the car and the garage paradox. And so the idea is that, um, that, that shows this kind of stuff is, is the notion of what's called um, length contraction. 
So the faster you see an object moving, the shorter you measure its distances according to, to relativity. So the idea would be that if you had a garage that was exactly the same width as a car, okay, uh, so that it would fit just perfectly in there if it was parked in there, and you have somebody standing at the doorway of the garage and then somebody else driving the car and the, dr and the car is just going blazing fast, like close to the speed of light fast, okay? He's traveling right towards that garage and he's not going to stop. So whatever he does, he's going to crash right out of the back of the garage. But remember, he'll fit right in there for a second, right? He should, right? Well, from the perspective of the guy sitting at the front of the, car, at the, front of the garage, okay, he sees the car moving really fast and sees himself as stationary. So the car will length contract and be shorter than the garage. So he'll see the back end of the garage, uh, the back end of the car enter the garage before he sees the front end crash out the back. Okay? On the other hand, the driver's point of view, he sees himself as stationary and sees the garage is moving towards him. So the garage length contracts and is now shorter than the car. So he'll observe the front end crashing out the back before the back end enters the, car, enters the garage. And both of these are somehow supposed to happen. Well, what it turns out is, is because that guy's traveling fast, the car's traveling fast to the reference frame of the guy sitting at the garage, his coordinate system gets a little angled. And what he measures, and since the coordinate system has to stay the same with that infinitesimal Pythagorean theorem, it forces what he considers simultaneous events to change. And so what happens is you can mark, you can plot those two events of the car exiting the out the back and the, and the back end hitting the front uh, <coughs> on, the, on either one of the coordinate frames, but what happens is in one of them, his sort of simultaneous axis, they'll occur like here and here. The other guy's axis gets tilted this way, and so he'll see the other one happen first before, before that one. So it ends up kind of reversing the order. It's very funky. I could draw a better picture for you if I had a whiteboard, but that's the basic idea. So even though the events can, are still plottable, and in fact look the same when you draw the graph out, their perception of the order it changes. Good. Could another example of that also be multiple referees at a basketball game? I absolutely think so. I mean, I, I think I saw a couple of those last night in the, in the Lakers Clippers game, you know. <laughs> Certainly, I like that. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Thank you again so much for listening to me.